Warning, this episode contains graphic language regarding suicide and self-harm. While no action of this nature occurs, the language may be disturbing. Hi, and thank you for being here today. I'm Husfus McCabe. Last time on The Ballad of Officer Superstar, we barfed below the corpse, again, and started looking into how the victim's clothes ended up in a locked trash can, though we didn't uncover much. We also discovered that we have closed over 200 cases and have only three confirmed kills, a startlingly good record, especially for the kill-happy members of Precinct 41. On the character development front, we completed our first thought cabinet thought, Guillaume Le Million, which I will never pronounce well giving us a permanent plus one to the pain threshold skill. We then started thinking about some kind of superstar because, duh, when are we not thinking about being a superstar? At the end, we leveled up, giving us another skill point to spend. Today's plan is simple. Now that it is past 1300 hours, we will search the Whirling and Rags kitchen. Before we head inside though, let's allocate that skill point. And while we are near Kim's car, let's also use his radio to contact Sylvie to ask if she made the call reporting the murder. We are going with Savoir Fair because Officer Superstar should definitely have more panache than he has demonstrated thus far. When he fails those Savoir Fair checks, it's a real kick in the uh, teeth. Yeah, teeth. That's the first body part that sprang to mind. Sneak under their noses, stunned with immense panache. See? Panache. Let's read the info. Cool for acrobats, thieves, unbearable show offs. Savoir Fair urges you to be better than you are. It urges you to be disco. Slip by others in Samarin boxing style, then tumble out the back with unexpected acrobatics. It enables you to move with silent footsteps, to groove to a good beat, and to lift useful ev evidence off perps without them noticing. It also makes you a cooler cop, whose athletic flair will certainly impress the citizenry. At high level, Savoir Faire will make you the king of cool, which is as much to say the most stylish douchebag in Revachal. Nobody will see you until you're ready to be seen, and then they'll get the full treatment, whether they want it or not. At low levels, however, you'll be a bumbling, feckless cop, unable to catch a pair of keys thrown by your partner without losing an eye. Yeah, see, we need more of this because we're disco. Let's do it. Oh, and I also turned down the weather volume because it was starting to sound like Dorothy's Kansas around here, although you wouldn't know it from the sound of the rain in my ears right now. Okay. Let's go uh, call Sylvie. Inside, you see a set of steering levers, a radio microphone, a pull-out toolbox, and the soft glow of the fuel preheater gauge. All right, let's pick up the radio again. Uh, and for those of you who, who watched the second episode, you will know that this did not go well the first time. That was in the pre-time travel days. This though. is Precinct 57. How may I assist you? I need you to connect me to a civilian, a Sylvie. She may have reported a murder. Of course. What is her number, officer? Kim, didn't Gart give you Sylvie's number? Yes, hold on. Her number is 005-1944-298. All right, viewers. Nobody prank call that number. That would be bad. But if you do, and something happens, leave a comment below. Start slapping a marching rhythm on your thighs. Give it a minute. She might be busy at the moment. Takes a bit to get to the phone. Officer, I have Sylvie Malaika on the line for you. Yes, hello? A female voice greets you through static. It sounds like she's a million miles away. Sylvie, I believe we've met before. This is me, a detective from the Whirling and Rags. Oh, right. Hello, officer. What can I do for you? There is no resentment in her tone. She wants you to ask her out. No question about it. Oh, look, we can now ask if she's seen our badge or our gun. Or the, how the paperwork ended up in here. Is there a seventh? Why can't I scroll, man? Nope, I guess there isn't. There it is. Oh yeah, I think I got everything I need. There is a seventh. Was it you who called the police? No, not me. But why didn't you call? 
didn't a corpse behind your workplace bother you? What? Of course it bothered me. But I thought the Union already knew about the corpse. What does this Union have to do with anything? No one calls the police. The Union would get angry. What do you mean by that? You know, what the Union says goes. People listen to them and they take care of their own, which is like everyone here. Wait, Kim, lower your microphone. Is she speaking the truth? The Union is the law around here? Legally, no. In reality, yes. Martinez is de facto policed by the Dock Workers Union. Hmm, that's fascinating. That, he could have said that to us before. Oh, we're going to push on here. Tell me, why exactly did you let a corpse hang in your own backyard for weeks instead of calling us? I... I didn't want to get in trouble with the others. What others? Push her further. Show oh, her the error of her ways. I don't think our authority skill is very high, but we're going to give it a shot. Actually, no. We're going to ask what others. The other people who live around here. Local people. I... I didn't want trouble. What trouble? You don't live here. You don't understand. Squealing is frowned upon here. Everything is dealt with, well, by the Union, internally. Hmm. Please, I just didn't want any trouble. Okay, I, I, I think we've pushed it far enough with her. She seems like a nice woman. I see. Don't worry about it. I understand. You do? Oh. What else can I do for you? Besides, we're going to meet with the Union later. Or we're going to spy on them later. Do you know who made that call? No, sorry. I don't. <clears throat> Not a lot of people have phones around here. Copper thieves take the wire. Wow, that's pretty goddamn desperate. People don't have the money to have the cables put in again. They use the Union's phone, or the one on the coast. So the Union has a phone, and there's one further down the coast. Got it. Okay. It was someone else. We'll find them sooner or later, officer. It just might take a while. Okay, so our task, that's what that notification flew by. That's our task to find out who made the call has been updated to reflect this conversation. Okay, next question. Yeah, go on. You quit your job at the Whirling. Why? You mean, why did I leave the bar? Honestly, I'm not really comfortable discussing it with you, sir. Eh, I think that's fair. Why not? Okay, did you leave the bar because of Gart? What? No, why would you even think that? <laughs> All three of these are great. He told me it asked you out. Are you saying it didn't happen? Like, as though there, the two options are he asked you out and you were so disgusted you quit your job, or he just didn't ask you out and was lying about it. Or, Sylvie, don't be afraid of that pig. You have to stand up for yourself. Or, so you do agree that quitting your job just because someone asked you out is an overreaction? I mean, the reality is probably that she left the bar because we had done something to her, something gross or offensive or something like that. And she assumes we remember. Let's go with this one. So you do agree that quitting your job just because someone asked you out is an overreaction? Please, don't bring Gar into this. It's none of your business. Ooh, we're pissing her off here. I already said I don't want to talk about this. You're messing everything up again. Uh, what, 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 what does she mean by again? Okay, let's shift tax. Uh, have you seen my badge? Yes, I know who you are. You're a police officer. Oh, she thinks we're flexing. This exact conversation has happened before. Establishing authority before this young girl seems to have been important to you in the past. Don't go there again. Okay, we will certainly listen to our rhetorical mind. My badge is missing. Have you seen it anywhere? Oh, no, I haven't. Sorry. All right. Real policemen have uniforms too, by the way. <laughs> Where's yours? <laughs> uh, fuck you, Composure. I'm gonna let it slide. I don't need answers for every little thing. Right. It's better to not ask too many questions, lest people start thinking you're a cop or something. Wow, Composure's a prick. Have you seen my gun? Please, no. Not this again. Everyone saw oh. your cool gun, Detective. <laughs> We're such a show-off. I showed you my gun. When did it happen? 
You were trying to impress some people with it. Everyone was eating, and... She stops hesitantly, not sure if she should continue. And what? What did I do? You were waving it around in everyone's face, begging them to describe it. You said it calms you, and then you started making suicide jokes. It, it got pretty graphic. Oh, shit. Oh, those again. I have been trying to wean you off them. Off of what? You know, when you put your gun, your actual gun, on your temple and pretend to shoot your brains out, off of that, people don't like that. This just turned very dark. Hmm, I remember this. You were screaming things like, My brains are all over the wall, painting them red. I won't be seeing it, cause these are my brains. I can't see without my brains. Very nice visuals there. Okay, at this point, even if Officer Superstar was at some point suicidal, and even if it was the alcohol talking, I think he's feeling pretty good about himself knowing that he has a really good record as a detective. So I think he would just move on. Let's go with, yes, but what happened to my gun? No idea. All I know is next you were waving around money instead, saying things like, Big bucks cannot lie, and guns can't buy money, but money can always buy guns. Okay, all of that is, uh, weird. It almost looked like you pawned it, but believe me, I did not ask. Okay, I guess that's all we learn about the gun. How about, do you know how my paperwork ended up in the trash container behind the whirling? Well, you tried to jam <laughs> it down the toilet, sir, clogging it completely. After I had unclogged the toilet and retrieved the paperwork, I threw it out in the trash, <laughs> thinking you didn't need it. <laughs> Pulled a trump and shoved all the paperwork down the toilet. I am sorry about that. Anything else, detective? She doesn't sound like she's actually sorry. You know, in an alternate timeline, we asked her if she wanted to grab a cup of coffee. I think that that would be a poor move. I think we have embarrassed ourselves enough with Sylvie. Let's go with, I think I got everything I need. Thanks. I do hope so. Please don't call me again. Oh, Bye. shit. Wait, why does she seem angry with you? Hmm. 42% chance and we cannot be retried. Uh, I found out on the website that red checks cannot be retried because the outcome of the check affects the story. So I think we should do this. I mean, either we're going to be successful here and maybe she'll feel better about us or we're going to burn a bridge that sounds like it's already burnt. Let's go for it. No, oh, she fail. doesn't have a problem with you. It must be someone else she's angry about. Some other guy like God. No, I think we're so self-absorbed. We're going to go, uh, okay, but I'm a guy. Sure it isn't about me? Trust me. You wouldn't want to be the guy here. You know how it is. Yak, yak, nag, nag. Oh my god. It's so, it's so chauvinist and condescending. I love it. No. You're the guy. You're Lieutenant Love. Matchmaker extraordinaire. Help the poor girl out. Lest she turns into a spinster. I'm happy to help, but maybe I could do so without all this internalized misogyny. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of an oddball, but he's not a misogynistic piece of shit. What misogyny? I'm just telling things the way they are. Can't a man be honest in his own head anymore? Our empathetic head is a douchebag. You have to act, Lieutenant Love. You have to calm that hysteric down. Tell it you've got everything under control. Then go and have a little boy's talk with oh. God himself. Oh my God. So then the question here becomes, we failed that empathy check. Do we have to follow what empathy is telling us? Or can I behave like less of an a-hole? I don't know. Let's see what happens. Think you can do that, Lieutenant Love? Oh my God. These responses are horrible. Are you still there, kiddo? Listen, I've got everything under control. Or... Daddy is going to take you on his lap, little darling. Or, please know, I don't want to say any of those things. Refuse the love quest, although it's wonderful. This makes me personally so goddamn uncomfortable. Uh, uh, I don't think he would behave this way. I certainly wouldn't want him to, but I don't think this character would behave this way. He's flamboyant, 
but not completely douchey. Let's go for please no, I don't want to say any of those things and refuse the love quest. You're just a gimp. What? You want to be more empathetic? I mean, it's true that we have no empathy because it's based on psyche, but come on now. Call was terminated by the other party. Anything else, officer? I'm done with the radio for now. 57th, over and out. Her voice disappears into the void. In the cabin, you see a set of steering levers, a radio on a hook, a pull-out toolbox, and the soft glow of the fuel preheater gauge. All right, while we're here, why don't we pull out the toolbox? A metallic drawer slides out from under the seat and clicks into place. The tools inside are neatly organized. Take what you need, officer. It's going to be a long case. I'm not protective of my tools, like some men are. Okay, well, so we can take the pry bar and the chain cutters and the flashlight. The pry bar we could have used to pry open the trash receptacle, but we got the keys instead. But I, I think we should take them all. I don't see a reason not to. The pry bar feels nice and cold in your hand. Heavier than you'd think. Cold and heavy. Like truth. You feel like you're reunited with truth once more. Mm, a man and his metal bar. Useful for opening all sorts of doors and lids. Very nice. Let's take the rubber handled chain cutters. The handles are long and sleek. Snap, snap, go the cutters in your hand. Hmm, okay. That sounds a little Stephen King-like. Take the hand-cranked flashlight. It's robust, weatherproof, and well-made. Police issue, blue. Nice, nice. Another very phallic device. Let's you see things in the dark you would otherwise miss. Oh, well, that's good. Although we haven't encountered any darkness yet, but we're still on our first day. Let's push in the pull-out toolbox. The pull-out toolbox slides back into its nest. Preheater gauge casts a warm glow on the steering levers and the radio on its hook. All right, let's see what happens when we run our fingers over one of the steering levers. The white suede feels luxurious under the touch and the metal clutch handle so very familiar in your palm. Tap on the fuel preheater gauge. As you tap on the gauge, the indicator pin jerks as if startled. It's in the large orange sector, indicating the engine is warm. Next to the gauge is a red switch labeled heat. Now, now, that's enough fun with the foldable headlights. <laughs> I know they are mesmerizing. They are also fragile. I'm not going to turn it on for you again. Oh, Kim, you're a killjoy. All right, let's go. All right, so we are off to the kitchen inside the Whirling in Rags. All right, here we are in the Whirling in Rags. Let's go. Let's try to... Oh, the kitchen door is actually open. Let's go in. Oh, okay. We've got one item here. We've got a door and we've got this person. So let's check out this uh, item in the sink. The dishes are drying. They smell of chemicals and pine trees. Oh, that sounds tasty to eat off of. Let's talk to this person. A thin man is smoking below an exhaust hood, occasionally sipping from his mug. This must be the Whirling's cook. His name is Gorasi Kubek. I'm sure I slaughtered that name too. As you step in, he nods toward the table and says something in a completely foreign language. The only words you can make out are Goransi and Kubek. I guess it's Goransi. Okay, it's definitely not his name. Whatever you do, please don't call him Goransi Kubek. Please, it's not funny. Oh, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder what it means. What should we do? Well, so logic succeeded here. So it's really telling us, all right, we're not going to do it. Hello, sir. Got time for a few questions? The man puts his cup down and replies something. His left hand drawing arcs in the air. You've got some impressive pots there. He smiles and bangs his ladle against each of his pots in turn. I wonder if the guy's like a mime. That would be hilarious to just have a mime right in the middle of the kitchen. It's almost like music especially with the sounds of assorted dishes boiling and simmering on the stove. I don't think I need anything else. Stay masculine. I feel like we did need something else, but uh, 
All right, we've got, I think yellow is intellect. Intellect thought. An aroma of spices, alcohol, and tomato hangs in the air. Let's see what color that actually is. Uh, oh, no, yellow is motorics. Okay, well, while we're here, let's look at our items. So we've got, no, new, no, new. Oh, here is the flashlight. Uh, equip this to discover secrets or shady areas. Equip these to open locked containers in the world. Uh, sorry, that was the uh, chain cutters. And equip this to open locked containers in the world. So we've got two of those. And then here's our task stuff. We haven't actually finished anything, but we have to keep searching for the collar. That's the one that was updated. That's what we would expect. Okay, let's go through this door. You see a heavy steel door with a prominent dimple lock. It's painted blue. We are going to try to push the door open, but I want to point out that it says, I'll be back, door. Mark my words. Let's try to push the door. The door does not budge. Let's touch the door. The cobalt blue surface feels rough to touch. The stainless steel door is flush with its frame on every side. Oh, I think that's implying we can't use the pry bar, but, you know, we're going to try. It leads to a side building adjacent to this one. The old building next to this half ruined whatever is behind it must be older oh. maybe we can actually just walk over there let's try it i wonder where this door leads you do it's a door in the back of the kitchen why do you care where it leads out of duty we may find something pertinent to the investigation hmm yes i suppose it's worth seeing if we can get in just to be thorough Ugh. as a side investigation this Ah, that was the wrong choice for this character. I should have said I'm drawn to the cobalt blue, but uh, we'll just move on, I guess. It's hardly a side investigation. You already have a name for it. No, the door is a mega investigation. I'm calling it Behind the Blue Door. It's hardly worth a title. Anyway, Gart is the person to ask about this. The cafeteria manager. And we got another task for the Behind the Blue Door. Just... Probably not very similar to Behind the Green Door. And if you know off the top of your head what I'm talking about, well, you are, uh, I guess, of a certain age, since that thing predates even me. Let's ask Gart. Can I help you? Gart, I saw another thing at the Whirling. Another thing? Great. I love those. All right, shape it up, Gart. There's a mysterious blue steel door in the back of the kitchen. Oh, yes, that door, sure. There's nothing mysterious about it. It's just a door. Do you know what's behind it? Do you have... No, I don't have a key. I don't know how to get there. And I don't care either. It's not like I've been wondering about it for ten years. It's just the Frit Warehouse, probably. Ah, so we were directed to the Frit Store for the uh, uh, smelling salts in an earlier episode. Maybe we can get there? We haven't actually seen the store yet. We'll see. Wondering about it is... Of course, exactly what he's been doing for 10 years. Yeah, thanks, Drama Brain. That was pretty obvious. Or some boring storage space with a bunch of old junk and dust. Junk and dust. He runs his finger across the counter to check for dirt. This guy is uptight. He's attempting to maintain an air of indifference. It's absolutely not convincing. I think you'd like to know what's back there. Prodding this guy, just poking at him, is definitely what Officer Superstar would do. Fine, okay, a little. But my job doesn't leave me time for wondering about one locked door in one of the cafeterias I manage. And yet he has, of course, been wondering. So, I haven't opened it. I have cleaned the whole place a hundred times over, though, after the animals. And I haven't found a key, so good luck with that. It looks like there must be a fourth item. Oh, no. There's something else I want to ask about. Yes? Uh, goodbye. We don't have anything else. Let's just clear off our new task. So um, explore the whirling secret passages. I wasn't even thinking about secret passages. There are strange doors in the whirling. No one knows where they lead. Find a way in and see what's hidden there in the, ho in the hostile cafeteria's forgotten corners. I wasn't thinking of them as secret passages. That's uh, much more mysterious, which, of course, we've been maintaining to Kim the entire time. Uh, let's take a jaunt upstairs and see if we can find that dancer. See if maybe she'll talk to us. 
Orangi, I think her name was. The door is closed. Let's try the handle. This door can only be opened with a key or from the inside. All right. Ooh, let's see if we can go get our tie. Let's leave. There it is. There it is, that tie. Just making fun of us. Just staring at us. Just holding itself high. What is this? What is this? Kim tries not to look at your broken down bathroom door. Oh, boy. Hey. This couch wasn't available before. The bed is cold and not particularly inviting. But it's yours. The sheets look awful. Maybe it was available and I didn't notice. The option to go to sleep becomes available oh. every night after 9 p.m. I see. It probably wasn't available. No time to rest yet. All right, let's see if we can get the tie. This fan has two chain pull oh, yes. switches. One ends in a tiny fan, the other in a light bulb. A truly horrific necktie has somehow attached itself to one of the blades. All right, we're going to pull on the fan. The blades come squeaking to a halt. It should be easier to reach the tie now. Okay. All right. Here we go. 72%. You swoop up yes! the tie. Snap. It's released from the blade. Oh, we crushed it too. Five points extra. What you have in your hand is a truly hideous thick tie with four or five different patterns. The knot reminds you of a noose. All right. Let's leave here. And go here. And we're wearing our tie. Ooh, it gives us plus one on Inland Empire. Vivid imagination. Horrific necktie. That's great. And you can see it here. I think I moved him around before. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Looking at the clock, we're up against the 30 minute mark. It feels like we didn't accomplish much today, but I guess that's not quite right. We learned that Officer Superstar shoved his badge in people's faces, waved his gun around, and threatened, apparently not for the first time, to kill himself. The kitchen was, honestly, less exciting than I'd hoped, but we did find a door to what might be a secret passage. Of course, we also showed the fan and the tie that they can't keep a good man down. Okay, a mediocre barely hanging on man, but you get the point. Come back tomorrow when we will explore the courtyard and the stuff to the west of the Whirling in Rags. You can then watch me completely forget that plan at the first shiny object. Thanks again for joining me. Please remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel. You can even set the bell to notify you the second a new video appears. As always, please remember to have your pets spayed or neutered, but not both.